Hey everyone, welcome to another College Algebra video. This is the beginning of Chapter 4, Section 4.1, Exponential Functions. Um, we're going to talk about the basics of exponential functions, how to evaluate them, graphing them. Uh, we're going to talk about the base e, which uh, e is a special number, kind of like pi, um, that we use in mathematics, and we represent it with a letter. We'll talk about it and uh, how to use it on your calculator. And then we will talk about compound interest formulas, which is one of the most prevalent uses of exponential functions for us as algebra students with regards to modeling. Okay, So what is an exponential function? An exponential function is a function that has the x, the variable, up in the exponent. All right, so we've been working with exponents for a while, like x squared and y cubed and stuff like that. Those are not exponential functions because the variable is not in the exponent. Something like 2 to the x power or 1 third all to the x power. That's an exponential function because the x is in the exponent. Okay, um, the rules are that the base b, b is the number there, the constant that is being raised to the x power, it has to be positive and it cannot be equal to 1. And think about it, 1 to any power is just 1, right? So that's not really anything but a constant function, so we're not going to call that an exponential function. But anything else, positive base, less than 1 or greater than 1, is, is good. Okay, so let's get a picture of what an exponential function looks like. Here we're looking at y equals 3 to the x power. Plug in a few numbers. Uh, notice that, or I guess I should say recall, that when you plug in a negative exponent, what does that negative do in the power? The negative represents the inverse multiplicatively. In other words, the opposite of multiplying is dividing, and so 3 to the negative 2 is the same as 1 third to the 2. And if you do 1 third to the 2 power, you get 1 ninth. All right, 3 to the negative 1 is 1 over 3. Um, 3 to the 0, remember when you plug in 0, any base that's non-zero raised to the 0 power is always 1. Always. You plug in 1, you get 3. You plug in 2, you get 9 right way up here. So you notice what happens. The function kind of is flat here over on the left-hand side for the negative powers. And then as you get to the positive powers, it takes off very quickly. All right, and this is the basic shape of all of our exponential functions. So it turns out that there are six things that all exponential functions have in common, and you should know these. Make a flashcard or two. Somewhere in your notes, you need to put these together. Okay. Um, pause the video if you need more time to write them all down. The domain of all exponential functions is all real numbers. The range of all exponential functions is all positive real numbers, greater than zero. Every single graph for an exponential function has a y-intercept of 0, 1, because if you plug in 0, you get b to the 0, which is 1. If the base is bigger than 1, then you're going to get this increasing to the right shape. If b is less than 1, still positive, you're going to get this decreasing to the right shape. Same shape, it's just flipped around the y-axis. All right, b is a one-to-one -one function, and what that means is it has an inverse. Uh, we'll talk about that inverse in section 4.2. And then one more thing about the graph, and it's, it's not exhibited very well here. Um, it's hard to see, but there's a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. It's a line that this function approaches, all right, depending on which way you're going. Um, but in this case, it does not touch it. Okay, so we need to label those on our graphs also. For, for me, I'm looking for two things on the graph of an exponential function. I'm looking for where this point ends up. It's been shifted and stuff like that, where that point ends up. And then I'm looking for the horizontal asymptote. So let me give you an example. f of x equals 3 to the x plus 1 minus 2. What's the base graph for that? The base graph for that is just 3 to the x. And we've already looked at 3 to the x, but just to kind of remind you, 3 to the x looks like this. It goes through 0, 1. It goes up like this, and it also has an asymptote dotted line there. Okay, it has an asymptote at y equals 0, and that has to be labeled. Okay, so on your work for quizzes and stuff, make sure you label these things. 
So what kind of shiftings from section 2.5, what kind of shiftings do these two things do? X plus 1 means we're going to the left 1 because we need less X to get the same shape. And minus 2 outside the function means we're going down 2. All right, so we're going to go left 1 and down 2. If we go to the left 1 and down 2, that means our point is going to move to negative 1, negative 1. So let's do a new graph. All right, we're going to have our this 0, 1 point. It's going to get moved to negative 1, negative 1. And then the other thing that gets moved is this asymptote. If you move left and right, the asymptote doesn't change. But if you move up and down, sure, that changes, right? So I'm going to use a different color here to represent our asymptote. And our asymptote gets moved down from y equals 0 to y equals negative 2. I went down 2, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. And then my shape, right, something like that. Looks very similar. This is my f of x function. All right, so I just take this base graph and I shift it over and down, and that's what I get. Okay, so you all try one. Here's a second function. Uh, don't forget to start with the base graph. What is the base graph of this, it's y equals 1 half to the x. Remember, 1 half, that's a base less than 1. So that changes things a little bit. Um, so sketch that here and then decide what happens with these two shiftings and then sketch the graph. All right, so pause the video and give it a shot and we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so the base graph, right? This is the new stuff. 0, 1, asymptote at y equals 0. And this time, because it's 1 half, we go down to the right. Right, we're decreasing. Okay, so if you didn't have this base graph, pause the video and try again to graph this function now that you have the base graph. For those of you that had this base graph, let's see what it looks like next. So what's going to happen? What does the x minus 2 do? Right, that moves you to the right 2. What does the plus 3 do? That moves it up 3. So we're going to take this point and we're going to go right 2 and up 3. That's going to get us to the point 2, comma 4. All right, label that. And then, of course, where's your asymptote now? If it was at, at, at 0, y equals 0, and you go up 3, then you're now at y equals 3. And our graph comes down. And so it does something like that. It does not come down. It does not actually touch the asymptote. Make sure you label it. Okay, and your, your graphing uh, tool on my math lab, if you're doing the homework on my math lab, for example, Make sure that you pick a dotted line to represent your asymptote. You're going to have to plot your graph, and you're also going to have to plot your asymptote on the same graph. Okay, so uh, that's how you'll get those. Okay. Next, we want to talk about the natural base E. E is a number that is between 2 and 3. It's officially, these are the first few digits. This keeps going forever. It's an irrational number. Like pi, it's got this infinite expansion. It comes from this definition. This is a calculus definition. I'm not too worried that you know that. Okay, but understanding how to use the exponential function with base e, all right, this is called the natural exponential function because we model natural phenomena with e to the x. Knowing how you do that on your calculator is important. All right, so just a quick show here, example. Here's a function that represents, models the gray wolf population of the Western Great Lakes. Um, and we're looking at evaluating the model in 2017, and that is 39 years after the model started. Okay, so x is equal to 39. So we're going to take f of 39. Okay, so what does f of 39 look like? You're going to take 1145 e to the point zero three two five times 39. Now, how do I plug this into my calculator? Well, I'm going to pull my calculator up for you guys. 
All right, and we're going to evaluate 1145 times E. Notice E of the X is on the TIs anyway. It's up in blue, so we got to do second to get E to the power. And then what's my power? My power is a product of two things, so put it in parentheses, 0 0.0325 times 39. Close the parentheses and then just hit enter. You should be able to do all these problems only hinting the equals button or the enter button once on your calculator. So we got 4,066.99. Obviously, we're talking about wolves, and so regardless of what we got here, we'd have to round up or down for a whole number, okay? And so that's how you plug in your calculator. The function itself looks like this, evaluated, and we get 4,067. And so the answer is that the gray wolf population is projected to be approximately 4,067 wolves. All right, that's how you use your calculator to evaluate those. A more practical example for us is understanding compound interest. There are two types of compound interest. You have compound interest per period, and then you have continuously compound interest. If you're doing it per period, periods mean how many times per year you're compounding. So if they say you're compounding annually, annually means once per year, so n is equal to 1. If they say something like quarterly, all right, there are four quarters in a whole, so n equals 4. How about something like monthly? Well, how many months are in a year? Right, 12, so n equals 12 in this formula. All, right. all the other variables are the same. A is the amount in the account at the end of t years, t is the number of years, p is principal. What does principal mean? That means my starting amount, how much you start with, how much you invest, how much you borrow, whatever, okay? And then r is the interest rate, but it has to be as a decimal. Usually it's given as a percentage, right? Percent means out of 100, so you need to divide by 100 to get it as a decimal. In the formula down here, you're going to plug in 0 0.06. You're not going to plug in 6, for example. Okay? So let's walk through one together. A sum of $10,000 is invested at an annual rate of 8%. Find the balance in the account after five years. I'm underlining all the important things. Subject to compounding quarterly. Okay, well, if it's quarterly compounding, we know we're not using the E formula. The only time we use E is if it says continuous. All right? Compounding. So we're using this formula, n compounding periods per year. What does n have to be if we're doing quarterly? That's right, 4. Okay. What are the other things we have? We have the amount we're looking for. We don't know that. We have the principal. Principal is how much we started with, $10,000. We have the interest rate given as 8%, so that 8 divided by 100 is 0 0.08. Don't think of it as moving the decimal point, guys. Just divide by 100 on your calculator. Okay. And then T is five years. So take all of that and put it into the formula above. You get 10,000, 1 plus 0 0.08 over 4 raised to the 4 times 5 power. Those are in parentheses. And once again, I'm going to type this out on my calculator uh, just to help you guys see what it would look like. Okay, so we're going to do 10,000. And we have parentheses. 1 plus, we have 0 0.08 divided by 4. And then, of course, when we raise things to the, to the power, all right, we have to group them. And so we get 4 times 5. And if we hit Enter, that's it, 14,859. And this time, we are going to report decimal places. How many? Well, we're going to report 2 because we're doing cents. We're doing money. And so 14,859. 59 and 47 cents is the final answer. Okay, so after five years, subject to quarterly compounding, your balance will be 14,859 and 47 cents. Make sure you read the problem correctly and very carefully. If it, it may say round to the nearest dollar, for example, then you have to round to the nearest dollar. Okay, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. I'm going to let you guys do one. If you'll read through this problem and pause the video, Notice that it's the same amount of money, it's the same percent, it's the same number of years. It's just compounded continuously, not 
quarterly. So that changes our formula. Okay? So pause the video, give it a shot, and we'll come right back. All right, so once again, the amounts, what we don't know. The principal's the same as last time, 10000 The interest rate's the same as last time, 0 0.08. The time is the same as last time, 5. It's just not, there's no N, right? So we get 10000 E raised to the 0 0.08 times 5. And if you plug that in on your calculator, you'll come up with a balance of $14,918.25. That's about $60 more, right? Last time we got $14,859. This time we got $14,918. Almost $60 more. Over five years, that's not that much, but every little bit helps, right? So make sure you're comfortable with using both of those compound interest formulas and handle in your calculator. And your, this is a pretty calculator heavy section for evaluation anyway. And so make sure you're comfortable with that. As always, I'm available for questions. So let me know if you have any. Otherwise, we'll see you later. Thanks.